If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Sing it, Justin. Happy birthday, Lisa. Ooh. That was too high. That wasn't that good. That's yeah. too high. Yeah. Now is it too Lisa? Ho- no, I don't have the the vocal capacity today. Yeah. See, well, well, I'm gonna retire. Dude, how do you pull random references like that out of nowhere, dude? That's like a. When was that? When did that that Simpson episode know. even play? Probably like ninety, 90 something. Yeah. I, I've said this before. I'll say it. again. I get triggered by like stuff. If I ever get on a game show where I'm allowed to call a friend. Justin Lisa, said I'm gonna call. It's Sorry, your birthday. I won't call you for Happy shit. Happy birthday. Uh, yeah, if you're Lisa. looking for commercial jingles or cartoons, yeah, that's probably good. If they're like, that's hey, pretty, if they're pretty, like, Sat, welcome to the game show where dude. you need to get the wrong answers. What friend would you like to call? I'll be like, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call Adam. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're in the cash cab. You yeah. know, like, yeah. you call me up. Welcome to the game where you take a word and make it sound like something different. Who should you call? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, could, that could exist someday, you know? Yeah. Who knows? But you're handsome. Yeah. This is true. This is. Uh, yeah. I mean, he knows this. But get me through Adam, life, Adam. I, I have a question for you, Adam. What's when it? did you realize? Okay, it's a serious question. All right. When did you first realize you were handsome? Hmm. I don't think I ever. When your mom. Told I don't you, think or? I ever felt that way. I think that we we talk about it, we joke about it all the time, but I don't think I ever really felt like I was just never. Super, no, not even now. Mm-mm. You don't feel handsome. Mm-hmm. No, I, I think that's. I think that's the big joke is that I say that, but in reality, when I was a kid growing up, I was. I didn't think anything but that at all. I mean, I was a very. I mean, I was like borderline anorexic skinny. Like you could see my. I had my rib cage was poking out. I was so skinny. Yeah, and but your face. I'm talking about your face. I had my two front teeth were completely yeah, turned. Yeah, but you got those eyes, bro. Yeah. Okay. It looks like you have eyeliner on. Well, yeah. I mean, if you're asking a serious right, question, Justin? if you're asking totally. a serious question, you want a serious answer. No, absolutely, I didn't think that way. Oh at all. man, yeah, I didn't. I, don't, I wasn't trying to get sad. Wow. Well, it's not a sad story. It's not depressing at all. But I, th- in fact, I think it builds incredible character, and I'm extremely grateful for that because it forced me to actually not rely on good looks. Now, I think maybe people that have met bodybuilder Adam who takes his shirt off and looks all jacked and ripped and is on professional photos on stage and shit might think that I'm this self-indulged wiener and think I'm super <laughs> handsome <laughs> and we joke and play about it but in in, re, in all seriousness absolutely not that now the not not being or not feeling handsome is what also forced me to build character and create confidence which then carries over and now we joke about it that I'm Handsome and I'm this and I'm that. I, it's just that you guys are a lot uglier. That's all it really oh, is. Yeah, that's true. So, Sal, so, that was a loaded question, Sal. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> you know like, got crazy. He really well, triggered he's, him. He's trying yeah. to be funny, but he's yeah. when he's sick, he's not as he's not as sharp as he normally is. <laughs> hey he's man, been, I just oh, called you handsome. He's, he's been off all what morning. What the fuck? Oh, <laughs> Listen, wow. I want to see a picture of you when you were a kid. I'll tell you if you were ugly. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. I'll show you what I I'll show you what yeah. I look like. I'll tell you the truth. Yeah, the truth. I'll tell you the truth. Total set you free. The total truth. Yeah. But anyway, okay. Well, we we do, we don't. Now that you crap this out, let's bring uh, it back. Uh, up. Yeah. I don't yeah. know why that has to be a crappy thing. I think there's there's a lot to learn with with stuff that that we don't talk about very much. I don't. I, I think that confidence can be built many many ways. And I think uh, thinking about some the way somebody look is a very superficial way to look at it. And I think it's. I wonder if it could be challenging for someone to be good looking too, though. You know absolutely, I mean? yeah. can be. For sure. I think. I think all the people that I I've think met about that like are a monster ex- hog. Extremely yeah. good looking. Most of those people got a lot of what they wanted when they were difficult younger that. because they were good looking and. It builds it. It both build character, and so it doesn't build a great character when you're somebody who has relied on your good looks to get all your yeses and get all the things that you've wanted in life. You become dependent on that, and then attached to that. And we all know that's fleeting, right? As we get older. Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah, definitely. Anyway, well, uh, we had a great interview in this uh, episode with Lisa Billu. So. She has a she's got a new YouTube channel, right? Or YouTube series, The Health Theory? Well, the impact this is similar to It's on it's not a new YouTube, it's a new it's a new, new series, series or yeah, whatever. Within their Impact Theory page that they're that they're doing that they're I mean, god, Tom and yeah. Lisa are just Dynamic. They're just content producers. Yeah, man. I mean, people think that we produce a lot of content. Oh, wow. I, yeah. would, I would argue that uh, We look up to them. Tom and Lisa pretty much shit on everybody I know out there as far as producing uh, the amount of content that you cannot possibly consume all the information they're putting out there. So what I liked about bringing Lisa on was, you know, her, the the part that the role that she plays with Tom and on the shows is this relationship theory. And I think they have a very dynamic relationship. They have a very cool story. 
She's and, got a lot of good like points and like uh, d- you know advice for for couples and stuff that she throws into this episode as well. So. I actually thought she was a psychologist until she she cleared that up when I asked that in the episode. Just because their her wealth of knowledge and experience uh, with her and Tom, and I think she shares that on the show, and I think she uh, distills a lot of information really, really well for the average person to consume, and gives you some really good tips in this episode to apply to your relationship. Yeah. So the YouTube channel's name is actually Tom Bilyeu. So it's T O M B I L Y E U. Uh, Health Theory is the show that she's hosting. Um, and she's also on relationship uh, theory with her husband, Tom. Now, they both co-founded Quest Nutrition, but now they're on a different mission altogether, which is to uh, just to bring uh, to, to bring change through narrative, right? Through story. So actually quite compelling. Their, inf- their, their channels are very, very compelling. Now, you can find Lisa Bilyeu on Instagram, at Lisa Bilyeu. That's L-I-S-A-B-I-L-Y-E-U. Um, also, I'd like to uh, mention that this month we are giving out free access to our forum with the enrollment of any MAPS bundle. Now, MAPS bundle takes two or more MAPS programs and puts them together based on a particular uh, goal that you may have. So if you want functional athletic performance, but you're also very interested in sculpting an aesthetic physique, we have the Sexy Athlete Bundle. Uh, if you're somebody who's training and working out very hard, but you find that your glutes just aren't responding the way that you want them to. You find them to be a weak body part. We have the Build Your Butt Bundle. Um, we have, what other bundles do we have that are available? Oh, the, the, of course, the Super Bundle, which is a year's worth of exercise programming. That combines several MAPS programs, so you do them in succession and get your body to progress throughout the entire year. Um, any of the bundles will give you free access to our forum, which normally you have to pay for. So go check that out at mindpumpmedia.com. And without any further ado, here is Lisa Bilyeu. Have you been doing the rounds now? Have you been getting on a lot of podcasts? I mean, are you just so busy over there? Well, the rounds, oh God, compared to you guys, not at all. I like <laughs> dabble in it, but... <laughs> how, do you, how, do you like, how do you like the podcasting platform in general? I love it. Yeah. To be honest, I like it. One reason like, I love you guys is you've got the conversation. Like, I really love just a chat. Right, and I can chat for hours. Yeah, yeah well, I, I feel I feel like when you listen to a, a podcast, if <clears throat> if it is if it's a conversation, it's more well. First of all, the the medium of podcasting I feel like serves that better. Like versus you know network TV where they they'll, they'll condense a forty minute interview mm-hmm. into like sound bites. Right, you want to hear the whole conversation, yeah. and it's so personal. And not only that, but it's boring when you treat like an interview like. And, yeah. You know, question one, question two, question three. Well, wouldn't three. you say that, I mean, we're really kind of, it's the changing of the guard when it comes to that, right? Because just 10, 15 years ago, that was like your, your very formulaic type of interviewers were the most popular, like your Brian Gumbles and your type yeah. of people like that, where now you look at, you know, people want more real. I'd rather hear somebody that messes up a little bit or kind of mm-hmm. goes all over the place yeah. that, with their thoughts. That, but at least I know it's a real conversation where some of the conversations that you would hear in interviews 10, 15 years ago, it's like, man, am I really getting what I want? Or am I just getting this big commercial right. about this person? Well, I know Joe Rogan's, uh, he gets more listens than I think all the top news networks combined. Yeah, Fox and CNN combined. And his average episode is like yeah. two to four hours long. Yeah. So it's a totally different. Well, it's yeah. long form too, so yeah. you, you know you can really listen to a real conversation without mm-hmm. all these interruptions of like, and now cut to commercial break. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's just annoying. I actually had one interview though about a month ago, and the guy had like all his questions were pre-written. He sent them over, and he even wanted us to title the episode. So literally, I got on the phone to do the the podcast interview, and he literally just ran through the questions. <laughs> <laughs> when we first we have no idea what we're talking about. When we yeah. first started doing <laughs> interviews, <laughs> that's great. I yeah, love that. Zero, yeah. We have zero idea where this <laughs> is going to go. When we when we first started doing interviews, this is what would happen. People would s- send us over, like, okay, well, what are you guys going to talk about with me? Yeah, and we'd go, well, fuck, I don't know. We'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll see fuck. where it goes. Yeah, we'll yeah. see where it goes when we when we meet you. Yeah. And uh, and they were just like, well. You know, I could, could you just give me an idea what topics? Oh, people and, panic sometimes. Mm. And yeah. so they we actually structure. had, to, it was really weird for us to like provide these questions. And it, it always happened this way too. We would give them to them because they felt so scared to come on the show without having some sort of idea right. what we were going to do. So we'd give them to them, but we never fucking went that direction. <laughs> it's like, it was just to pe- please them. Yeah, it was to please them yeah. to get them on the show. Then we get them on the show, then we talk about whatever we want to. We're going to ask you what your favorite yeah. color is. Yeah. And all that but I actually stuff. think that's more enjoyable. Like, I don't know where we're going to go, but like 
let's have fun. Right. It's Absolutely. more real. It's if we were to, and I think that's the idea, or that's at least the idea that we try to uh, give to our audience is that listen, if I'm meeting this person, I'm talking to them, I want you guys to hear the questions that I would really ask them. Mm-hmm. You know, not this like what you probably already know about them. You could probably Google half right. the guests that we have yeah. and learn all the basic information that uh, the average person interviews. I want to dive into their, like what makes you tick, yeah. you know? Yeah. So we like that for sure. <laughs> so what is your background? Just quickly for the audience, what, you know, tell us a little bit about your history before we get into more of the recent yeah, um, how far back do you want me to go? Ooh, I don't know. Um, where are you <laughs> Adam from? Likes to go I love your right accent. Away. You're obviously from England. What part I of am. what part of the UK? I'm from London. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'm Greek, so my family from Cyprus. Um, and I love the Greek people. I'm Sicilian, so we're almost very close. <laughs> we're very similar. Yes, we are. Very similar. In culture, good food, for sure. Yes, amazing food. <laughs> yes. Um, met Tom about 17 years ago. So I was studying filmmaking at university in London. Felt like I didn't get enough experience. My friend gives me this brochure and is like, hey, they've got this film course in Los Angeles called the New York Film Academy. You get to go backstage at Universal Studios. You get to film stuff. So all you need is, you know, $10,000. I can't remember how much the course was, but you can go and do this like super intense course um, and you get to study film. So I was like, this is amazing. So I had to persuade my dad because I obviously didn't have that money. So I sat down, I was like, this is why I should do it. And he's like, I need a pros and a cons list, like why you should go and why you, you know, like what are the benefits? So to cut a long story short, managed to persuade him, come to Los Angeles, day one, I walk into the studio, to the office, and this tall, handsome American man is standing in front of me. (laughs) Um, Little did I know he would end up being my husband. Mm. Um, And so for a month, I was just like staring at him from afar and he didn't give me the time of day. And he was like so cocky about it (laughs) that it just made me more interested in him. Mm. Um, And then, yeah, after our first day, we both thought like, this is awesome. Like this summer fling. I'm thinking I've got a great story to tell my friends when I go back to England that I hooked up with this like hot American dude. (laughs) He's Mm. thinking this is amazing because he just came out of a relationship with a girl went a bit crazy on him. So he's like, this is perfect. Legally, she has to leave the country. Like, this is the perfect situation. Even if she goes crazy, I can yeah, get rid of her. Yeah, literally, like, the visa's going to take care of that. <laughs> um, so we both went into it completely just, like, thinking we were going to have some fun. And within four weeks, we both completely fell for each other. And um, I went back to England, and he flew to London to see me, and we ended up doing a whirlwind romance for two years. Um, and then eventually I came to LA and we built our lives and I started off as a housewife, um, just think, thinking, you know, I'm going to support my husband, like we have a path, I'm going to take care of Billu Enterprises is what we would call it, mm. because I didn't like the phrase housewife, mm-hmm. it emotionally didn't fit with me. Sure. Mm. So I took care of everything so that he could go off and just focus on work. And then he came home one day and was completely miserable with everything he was doing. And he's like, I know we just bought a house, but... I want to start this new company with my business partners and then we want it to be fitness. And, you know, how do you feel about putting the house up um, basically as collateral? And um, Was that scary? Wow. It really was scary, but I've never felt like um, that was my purpose to like have a house. Mm. Like I wasn't the person that was like, this is going to be my life. And so I didn't really hold strong to the house over what my husband wanted and what his vision was. And I so believed in him and our future that I was like, I can buy another house. Like if this fails, cause it wasn't like, this is going to work. Mm. It was like, if this fails, who cares? Like, mm. we'll just get another house, babe. We'll figure it out. Um, but you feeling like that you're being supported and that you have me to back you. Like that to me was the most important thing. Ever. Oh, that's all. It's such a great thing to hear because mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I was just going to ask you, was part of it just your belief in what he was doing or anything that he did? Was he that kind of a person to you? Where you are like, you know what? I, I believe him. Well, was in he your, in Quest when you guys first met? So when no, you, no, so he wasn't even doing. This Quest. is what they did. This is how you started Quest, yeah, right? Is you put the house up for right? We'd already been together for nine years. Oh shit! We'd okay. been married for like five or six years, and he was very much chasing chasing entrepreneurship. He found his business partners, and he was like this is our way to success. Like we're going to earn enough money. We're going to then make, take the money and we're going to make movies. Like that was the big plan. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, I'll support you. We'll figure it out. 
But he was miserable with the tech company, with his business partners. And so eventually he just came home and was like, something has to change. Mm. And because I'd seen he was miserable, I was like, as your as the partner, like, I'm not going to prioritize money home over your happiness. Like, mm. that's crazy to it me. It must have been at this point, I mean, because, uh, you know, when you're a partner with somebody, how they feel can also influence how you feel. Did you feel a sense of like relief, like, good, let's change something because you're not happy and it's, yeah. it's making things difficult. A hundred percent because he'd been so closed off for, um, you know, maybe two or three years prior because he was so focused on mm. making money, making money, making money that I had seen that spark switch off in him. And for me, it's like, it is my duty as the wife, as the partner, as the Billu Enterprises to, to help get that spark alive again. And when he came home, it was absolutely scary. But what I always do in life in general is like, what is the worst case scenario? Because mm. if I can live with the worst case scenario, absolutely. I can attack something 100%. Mm. Totally. Mm-hmm. And so I said, the worst case scenario in this situation is losing the house, but not having a roof over my head. Like, I don't want to live on the streets. And that was just to be real. I don't want to live on the streets. So, okay, well, I know that's never going to happen. I have family. We have friends. The reality of that is it's never going to happen. Yeah. And I don't want to starve to, be- to death. Again, I have family. I know the reality is that's never going to happen. So when my two worst case scenarios are okay with, like, I know that's not going to happen, then what does a house mean? Nothing. Right. So I definitely went all in, but it wasn't like blind. I support you no matter what in regards, like, if I felt like it was going to fail, we would sit down and we would discuss and I would be very open about my thoughts and my perspective on why this could potentially fail and how we protect ourselves from that. Um, but emotionally, I'm all in with him. Like, whatever you want emotionally, like, we will get there. We just have to agree on the route to get there. Um, but feeling that 100% support to me is what marriage is. And, um, yeah. I Lisa, you, you have a psychology background too, don't you? I don't. Oh, you don't? No. You just have a passion for I it? I do. Okay. Yeah, I just have a media background. Everything is filmmaking. That's, I know you were saying that right now, and I actually thought you actually had a psychology background. Because no. I know you guys dive into the, the relationship theory, so I've seen some of the episodes that you guys have done. I love what you guys are putting Thank out there. You. Where does the passion for that come from? Um, I think the truth is, is that Tom and I have, we've used psychology with each other because you actually use it in filmmaking, right? Understanding your audience, understanding how people think and Mm. then tapping into it. Like what type of music do I use if I want them to feel X emotion or, you know, what type of camera move do we use? Things like that. So I've always loved psychology. Tom's always loved psychology. Um, And so when it's come to our relationship, we've just adopted that. Okay, well, how do you actually feel about this? And what are you actually thinking here? And people used to think we were crazy. Like, you don't talk to your husband like that. You don't, you know, you just, like, for instance, the wedding. What does it actually mean to you? Most women gave me the advice of, like, it's your wedding, you do what you like. And the husband kind of comes (laughs) along for the ride. Um, But he was like, no, for him, it was like, you know, a bonding of, um, you know, these two people coming together and it was very emotional and he got a tattoo to kind of prove that he was going to be different after we got married than from before. So it was really just going deep and having the honest conversations that my friends never had with their partners. And over time, people used to say, you're crazy, you're crazy, you're crazy. Well, we've been together for 17 years and in my opinion, have the strongest relationship we've had in this entire time. Mm. And so it's really that um, understanding that psychology actually does make a difference and understanding how the the other person thinks makes a difference to how you're going to act towards them. Because, you know, for me, it's if you want to make someone happy, okay, what is your love language? Um, I don't know if you guys have ever read Vanessa, Vanessa Van Edwards' book, Captivate. No. It's very similar to the love language okay. book. But you can actually also adopt it with um, for work. But it's like, what is your employee's language on being appreciated in the workspace? Like when they achieve something, how do they hear praise, right? Some people may want a pay rise. Other people may just want public recognition. Um, and the same with relationship, like what is that language that you use where your husband or your wife feels like they're loved, feels like they're appreciated. And so psychology really ended up being like the tool to get me to have an amazing relationship and allowed me to, you know, us. Was there any, was there any hesitation to do a show like that? Just knowing everything that you guys have on, on your plate and to kind of put yourself out there and your relationship out there uh, was there any hesitance to that? Like, I don't know if I want to do that. Yeah, there was a bit because 
I thought if I'm going to do this, I have to be real. Like no BS. You can't, you know, I don't want to hide like the the truth behind getting a successful relationship and what it takes. Like I wasn't, didn't want to just go and do the, you know, the, the fun fair. I was like, if I'm going to do, I have to be honest. But then if I do it and I'm honest, are people going to judge me for it? Yeah. You know, and so I had to really overcome that. And then the more I did it, because Tom's really good at coaching. So he's like, babe, you know, just be yourself. And, you know, he would lead the conversation. And the biggest thing he ever said to me was like, I'm your safety net. Like if something bad happens in a conversation, if I feel like it's derailing or like, you know, I'll be there for you. And Mm. so that just really allowed me to go, okay, be yourself, Lisa, and see what comes of it. And the more I did it, the more people responded well to it. Oh, I bet. That's excellent. I I know a lot of times, just from my experience, when I get the most wisdom from people on a particular topic, it's because they have dealt with challenges on that topic on a personal level, Mm -hmm. and which is, because here's the thing, like if you want to learn a lot about, obviously we're we're in fitness, right? So you want to learn a lot about building muscle. You talk to the person who's had the most struggle building muscle because it's 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 something that they've had to work towards for years and years and years and really had to figure out same thing if you want to talk to somebody about depression the person who's had to battle and deal, deal with depression is the person that may probably give you some of the best results or, or or wisdom because they've had to on a personal level really dive deep and uh and, and examine these things what are some of the like is that true for you like you talk a lot about relationships and you've done and I can only imagine the challenges that a relationship would have coming together and building a, I think it was the fastest billion dollar empire and, you know, fitness supplement food company in history. And I know what, what it's like to build what we're building. That's nowhere near the speed or size of what mm-hmm. quest, you know, did. And, and I can see the, the, the challenges it puts in my relationships. Mm-hmm. Like what are some of the challenges you guys went through? Is, is that accurate? Is that, is this something that you guys are, good at because you've had to work so hard at it a hundred percent and that's the thing we've fallen flat on our faces we've butted heads you know we've had disagreements and it's about navigating those waters and figuring out what works and the the hardest thing i think for us that we had to attack was there were different elements to our relationship so at work um so we were co-founders but he was still technically my boss so i ran the media department at quest um but he was the president. So as a scale of like in any company, he was my boss. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? Then Mm -hmm. when we're at home, okay, our relationship, um, to me, he's the alpha male in our relationship and I'm the beta and we've sat down and we've actually established that language and understood what that means for our roles within the family. Um, But I still have, let's say, um, the ruling of the house, but in our relationship, he has, you know, like there's certain things that we've established. Um, And then now with impact theory, so with the show, I'm the executive producer. So I treat him like my host. Mm-hmm. So the dynamic switched yeah, just completely. Role play switched. So it's it's been a lot of fun, really, kind of sitting down, going back to the psychology of things. It's like, okay, well, how do you feel about this situation? What role do you play? What role do I play? And I remember at work at Quest one day, I turned around to him and I said, if I don't do my job properly because I never want to be in a position because I'm a co-founder or because you're my husband or anything like that that doesn't make me feel good I need to bring value so if I'm not bringing value in my role as running the studio you need to tell me fire me demote me or hire someone above me I was like I'm giving you permission to do that Um, because I thought as a husband that's going to be pretty hard to tell your wife like hey you're fired or you're not doing a great job I'm hiring above you and he just looked at me completely deadpan and was like baby my goal is to provide for the family. So even if you're the one getting in the way of me providing the family, I'll fire you in a heartbeat because you're not going to get in the way of my goal. Um, and so I was like, I completely respect that. Um, and yeah, same with the house. We kind of figured out, okay, you know, we were butting heads. Um, he is very artistic. So he always wants to say and like the furniture and the look. And so it's like, okay, well, instead of us butting heads, who owns what? Okay, the house, because it feels like, you know, it's like the female wants the nest and, you know, I take a lot more, um, I think I put a lot more weight to the house than he does. So it's like, well, okay, well, if we butt heads, I want the final say because it means more to me. It's, you know, it's the nesting part of me. 
She was like, cool. So if we've ever butted heads with the colour of the wallpaper or something and we can't persuade each other, I get final say and he's very respectful so, and steps back. So is it your call to make all the, the, the fucking four inch cable wires going through the house? And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is, that that your, was, is that your design? <laughs> that was, in fact, that was him because he's like, you never know, we might need it. And I'm like, it's an eyesore. <laughs> um, but again, like I'm, you try to be respectful of each other. So it's like, all right, I don't feel strongly, leave the cables there. And of mm-hmm. course, two years later, the freaking cable are still there <laughs> as you've seen yeah, right yes, yes, yes. Um, so yeah so we've just had like these agreements and that all stemmed from always butting heads right butting heads in the workplace butting heads as husband and wife butting heads um, and when I was saying like about the alpha and the beta role it's like okay well who leads the family it's like having a business right you can only have <clears throat> one real visionary and then other people need to okay like be around you I think like help execute figure out but if you're both at that same level and you both have the same um, role, I don't know, like it's never worked for me and him. Mm-hmm. So we've always tried to establish roles ahead of time. Is there something that you uh, have have to put your foot down with Tom? So I know you say you're the beta, but you know, with Katrina and I, we have a very similar relationship. We work together. We've been together for seven years. And if there's anything that I have a, a really bad habit of is it's becoming so plugged in and, and disconnected mm-hmm. from each other that I'm so myopic about work. Right. And, you know, and I and I've definitely have given her that carte blanche to be able to say, hey, wake the fuck up. We haven't worked on us or done anything together and she'll schedule a trip. Mm-hmm. And we'll, it doesn't matter if we have work with that. It's being shut down because of that. So she's become that in our relationship and I respect that when she does it and she respects me enough to allow me a little bit of latitude of like, I know it's a lot of stress at work right now. Is there something that like you have to put your foot down every once in a while and say, Hey, wake up, Tom, we've got to, we've got to do this. We've got to do that. Yeah. We've, and I think it's fantastic that you guys have established that. And I think that's where people get um, caught up a lot is they don't really establish like whose role it is to do what. And so because Tom gets hypermyotic, like he like focus, nothing else exists around him when he goes into the zone. And I know that about him. And as his wife, I want to support him. But at the same time, to me, there are certain things that are important and he has to, I don't want to say snap out of it, but I need to bring that to his attention. Mm. So we've had that agreement that if there are moments where I start feeling like, hang on, we're, we're not connecting right now. I will absolutely, I'll sit him down. And it's like, okay, grab your calendar. What does your agenda look like? Like I'll put it on the schedule. Like it's a, you know, an appointment. Yeah. Um, because I get that I have to to allow him to, you know, do the business that he needs to do. Um, but yeah, I'll absolutely say, OK, I need two hours of your time and I want it on a Friday. OK, well, when can we how do we make that happen? Mm. And when he does, he puts his phone down, he switches off. He's very respectful and he doesn't then, you know, put it to me like, oh, you're very needy. Because I try to be very conscious about when I need his time and when I don't. And so we have this great understanding that if I ring that bell bell or put my foot down, it catches his attention immediately. And he's, you know, 100% 100 in. I think it's absolutely brilliant that you say you have established roles because it's... Nowadays, that's a much more difficult, for whatever reason, much more difficult conversation to have because of whether it be gender stereotypes or whatever, for people to say, this is my role, this is your role. doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Mm-hmm. Um, but with any successful anything, like you have a team, you know what your position is and your job is to execute to the best of your ability at your position. If we have running backs and you know and tackles acting like quarterbacks in a game, you're going to fail. You right. need to know what you're going to do and you do, and, and you need to go for it. But that can be a difficult conversation to have depending on the role what were some of the roles that you guys had to discuss where that was a tough one, where you guys had to say, okay, this is what I'm doing, this is your, what you're doing, or was it easy? Um, no, definitely wasn't easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, a big thing I think was, as I went from being a housewife to an entrepreneur, there was a big change in me because um, you know the expectations were different and your daily activities are different. And so when I started working and I'm, when we started Quest, so I basically started shipping bars from our living room rug. And then it was like, oh, this, we've got like 10 orders today. Like, that's actually a lot. Like, maybe we should think about having like a, like putting them in the garage. And, you know, like start shipping them through the garage. And so before I knew it, it went from, I was shipping from the living room floor. I was learning how to print orders. I was doing it from the garage to then we had a, you know, 10,000 square foot um, storage space. I was hiring forklifters. I was hiring, you know, people that could work the forklift. I was... 
So before I knew, I literally blinked and I had 40 employees underneath me just in my department alone in a shipping department that I had no experience doing. So I just learned as I went along. Mm-hmm. Wow. How fast was that? What was that? Oh, what was that the time was, frame for that? Uh, probably two years. Two years? Yeah. I went from that to, yeah, about 40 employees. Wow. It was crazy. And I'm not tech savvy at all, but it was one of those like, you just got to learn it, you know, like mm. get your hands dirty. Um, but those employees that, especially initially, um, we were hiring from the inner cities. So they were gang members. They were people who, you know, had criminal records. And so I had, I couldn't be a pushover. Now I'm five foot one with a British accent. It's hard for, you know, <laughs> thugs to kind of take you seriously unless you really like hold your, your ground. And that's exactly what I did. I was like, all right, I'm not going to let the company down. I'm not going to let my husband down. I've got something to prove here. So run this like a tight ship. And so I don't care. You know, there was a guy that was like six foot three and Tom walked in once and I was, you know, kind of letting him know where he'd messed up. And I was, you know, he's like, you're not scared of anyone. I was like, well, I can't be. You can't show the fear. And, but because of that, I started to harden as a person, as a female. It started changing you as an individual? Right. So before I was a housewife, I was very um, nurturing. Hmm. My husband comes home, baby, here's your dinner, your clothes are ready for you. I've sorted this out for you. Very nurturing. Now he comes home and he's like, I'm tired. And like, don't be a pussy. (laughs) Yeah. But but seriously, right? It became like that where it was like, you know, I don't have time to make you food. You're going to have to deal with it yourself. And, Mm. you know, so that type of the personality changed. Mm. And we had to sit down and go over that um, because in establishing he's going to be the alpha, what I mean by that is if someone breaks into the house, I want him to go and defend me, mm. right? That's what alpha is to me. Um, if something happens and someone's hurt, he wants me to take care of them. So that's type of thing. Um, and so when we were kind of establishing these roles and I started to harden and I started to not take care of him as much anymore, well, does that now mean that I'm not a nurturing wife okay well if that's what he's looking for in a wife then how do we navigate that because you can't pretend it's not happening and I don't want him to be resentful five years down the line that I'm not the wife he actually wanted and vice versa I don't want to be resentful that he's not the husband that I actually wanted so we basically broke down all the skill sets that we had all the things we wanted to be all the things we expect from each other and then say okay well what makes sense And he realized that I'd never come alive before like I had when I became an entrepreneur. Mm. So for him, he was like, there's this part of him that wants me to be nurturing as the wife, but this other part of him that he loves that I've come alive. Mm. And so he said, I've had, I have to accept that you're going to drop this part of your personality because you can't be both. You can't be like this hard ass working side by side daily and then be home and make sure that everything's taken care of. And he's like, I think I need to let go of this. So we had that verbal discussion that that was something he was willing to let go of. What would you say, Lisa, right now that you and Tom both individually are kind of working on, whether it be relationship-wise or business, what personal growth-wise, what what's something that you're currently working on right now? Mm, well, over the last three years, I've really battled with health. Um, I've had major microbiome issues. Mm. Um, so and- common, by the way. So common, so, so lots common, of people. Sorry, yeah, yes. yeah. So common. Are you finding that because you're you're tied into the health uh, industry? At least you were yeah. very deeply with Quest. It seems like it's happening all over the place. Yeah. When it first happened, I was embarrassed because I was like, "Here we are. We own one of the largest nutrition companies in the world, and I can't eat our product. Mm. I literally couldn't eat it. Um, anything with anything processed, anything with artificial sweeteners, whey protein, like none of that. My, I just couldn't digest it anymore. And so for a year, I felt embarrassed. I felt badly that you know, here we are with this company, and I can't talk about. And no one asked me to not talk about it. I just felt like in myself, I couldn't talk sure, about right. it. Um, and Tom took it upon himself to really say like, this is my problem to solve. And so he's spent like the last two years, he reads ferociously, reads books about health to try and help me. Um, and so as individuals, it's quite difficult when you're dealing with something like this, because for me, I recognize it's going on and I recognize um it's really affecting my hormones, right? Because there's certain foods I just can't eat. I can't eat consistently. I always have stomach cramps. And so it's affecting my hormones. I have to be aware of that. So as an individual, I've really been working on the last year on making sure that how my that my diet and what I eat and the pains that I'm going through do not translate over to 
my emotions in, in, in an erratic way because the second that that happens, it then spirals into your business and your personal mm-hmm. life. And now I become like the crazy wife that's just like crying for no reason and that's not fair on him and that's not good for our relationship. So I have to understand what is going on with me. And so for me, that's been a big thing is understanding what I'm going through, what my emotions are, you know, um, what I'm really feeling and then separate that from what makes sense like I'm feeling emotional about this like Tom you've really upset me but the truth is he hasn't actually said anything to upset me it's my emotions that are kind of going crazy um so that's what I'm really dealing with as an individual and then as a couple that we're constantly communicating on the health front because he's very um strategic okay do this do this do this who cares about the emotions doesn't matter like you have to and you know you have to eat like this and you and for me, it's not that easy. I get it and I will absolutely do it. Like I don't use that to stop me, but I have to make sure that um, I'm at least acknowledging my emotions. And just as a female and for myself, I find that useful. I find that a useful tool to then propel me forward. But because he doesn't do that, he will just like, there's no emotion. It's strategic. Do this, do that. We're having to navigate finding that understanding with each mm. other so that he doesn't feel like, I'm not actually actively working towards something that he can see that I am trying, but that I may not be doing it in the way that he thinks is best. There's there's a a, a common myth, and I think it I mean it originated in Western um, health or Western medicine that the emotion the emotional side is separate from the physical side, when they're actually you can't separate them. It's actually right. quite impossible. So. If you were to, I mean, and they can test this, um, you could think of something that creates an emotion within you. And we see physiological changes within the body happen immediately. And the road actually travels in both directions. We can obviously cause physiological changes to your body, which will then cause emotional changes. You're talking about your gut um, or your microbiome. Mm. We know that, and this is just what we know factually, but there's much more to this that we're learning and that's that the, the, the majority of your neurotransmitters are produced by your gut. I mean, people will take things like uh, SSRI drugs, which are you know serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors, which increase circulating serotonin in the brain. But that's playing with the small amount of serotonin that's already in your brain. The majority of it's being produced by the gut. And if your gut is off, we know now that it will ho- totally affect how you feel and even how you think. They've even done fMRI studies with uh, with women, in fact, where they've you know, they'll, they'll image the brain and then they'll give them a probiotic and they'll notice that the brain actually changes, the blood flow changes within the brain in real time after the probiotic, you know, is consumed. Mm. So you really can't separate the two. Tom comes across, and I've met Tom quite a few times. We love Tom. Uh, we love you guys, by the way. And he, but he is also extremely driven. And when you read his posts and you see what he says, it's very much the, you know, wake up, grind, make it happen. Don't stop, push, nothing can stop you. And that can lead to, um, uh, it can lead to, you know, HPA axis dysfunction. It can, you know, you might ignore your body signals because you're so focused on pushing um, to the to the sense where your health may actually start to falter. Have you guys encountered any of that? Or is that the struggle between the two of you where you're trying to kind of soften it and he's always pushing on that hard edge? No, he's actually really good at, like yes he says grind push hard but he has like this un- internal like um what would you call it like, like a rev limiter yeah like he just knows okay like this isn't serving me anymore like working this hard actually is clouding my judgment i can't make good decisions Excellent. so i need to go get sleep i need to rest i'm the opposite and that's actually mm. been a big problem so you find me. that you just keep going oh i will completely i'm like a bull in a china shop sometimes <laughs> like there's no stopping me and the problem is even when my my digestion is screaming what the hell are you doing like it's cramping because I have such a strong head Mm. I can keep going and my head doesn't communicate with my gut it doesn't communicate with my body and I've recognized that and I've recognized like okay Lisa your mind is very strong but your body actually isn't and you need to start making sure that you're addressing the communication between the two because um, a big part of it is you know like you were saying the gut is so powerful until we recognize that um, I think we're going to have like may just keep going with major issues and the one thing so I've worked 
worked with a company called Viome. I don't know if you mm. guys have heard of them. Mm-mm. They basically um, have helped me. Um, they have like an in-house test and they send it to you and you can do it at your house. You take your um, like a stool sample um, weight and measurements and all of that and you send them your information. They then take um, your sample and they break it down and tell you all the micro um, microbes in your gut and your levels and all They basically grabbed me and was like, okay, well, the things that are going on with you is you have SIBO, you have to deal with that, you have a parasite because you don't have enough healthy bacteria to fight off the parasite, it's just been living inside you. Um, your gut bacteria is completely skewed, so you actually have, um, it was something like 6% of the amount of gut bac- the healthy bacteria that I need only had 6% of it. Mm. So while everyone else, let's say, has like 30 different variations, I had like two. Oh, wow. So very I, little diversity. Yeah, very little. Diversity. What was your diet leading up to this? Was it were you eating like super keto or was it because I'm assuming they were probably talking about lactobacillus and the bifido bacterium. So um, hmm, now you're yeah. Uh, you, Maybe I'm assuming. Yeah, so I, I don't know. But were you was your diet very restrictive leading up it to was, this? Yeah. Oh, okay. And that was a problem. I had about 10 to 15 years of antibiotic abuse, mm. I guess you'd call it. So it was a vicious cycle. I was um, I was on a restricted diet because I had been told, hey, fat is very caloric and it's bad for you. You shouldn't eat it. Hey, carbs is really bad for you. So I was on a pretty much just a protein diet. Oh. Um, and I thought that's the way that you build muscle. So eat as much protein as you possibly can and everything else don't touch. Now I was getting sick. So I was taking antibiotics. I had a restricted diet, so I wasn't replenishing my gut. Perfect storm. Perfect storm. Literally, I was going probably for 10 years having antibiotics, maybe every six to eight weeks. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So I was getting sick. And then the more I was getting sick, the longer it lasted. Wow. So it just got to a point, <clears throat> excuse me, where literally my my whole digestion just crashed. And it, I've been on a three-year bat, you know, battle and trying to rebuild it. Um, what were your symptoms? Because we have a lot of listeners that have gone through stuff like this. And I think you get caught in the cycle and you feel like this is like normal or, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And what, what were some of your symptoms so that people can listen and be like, okay, I need to ch- get this checked out. Yeah, I love that you said that because I literally thought it's normal. Mm. Like, oh, it's normal that when I have a chocolate cake that my stomach is going to cramp and I'm going to be in pain for 24 hours. Like, I didn't even, which is crazy to me that I used to think that. But it's true. Like, I really did think that. Um, So it was things like that where all of a sudden you have a new type of food and it completely, like, it would, I don't want to say paralyze me, but I... For 24 hours, I wasn't able to stand up for longer than five minutes. Mm. I mean, it got to that point mm. where I would have one thing that was off what I would regularly eat and it would just unravel this whole like pain and um, digestion issues and inflammation and it got worse and worse. So let's say 10 years ago, I would try a different, like let's say it was a cheat day and I'd have a chocolate cake. Mm. It's like, oh, that really like upset my stomach and I'm not sure why. And you know, year after year after year, it got from that to, wow, I I can't really do much today. And then it got to, wow, I can't actually stand up today. And that's when it was like, okay, this isn't normal. Something's going on. But I didn't really look into it until one day I got the stomach flu. And it that is what like completely just threw me off. And was it just didn't want to go away? Or you just yeah, like, uh-huh. I, I literally then couldn't eat. Like I couldn't eat period Mm. so i would try to eat a bit of beef like some fatty foods wouldn't work try to have chicken like i just i was losing weight my hair started falling out because i wasn't getting any nutrients my nails were breaking um and we were both like we don't know what to do like i don't know how to fix this and so i went on a ketogenic diet because one of tom's theories was your digestion is so inflamed all the time Every time you eat, it's just, it's like treating it like it's um, a uh, foreign object. Right. It's trying to get rid of it. It's autoimmune. Right. Yeah. Well, so I went to an autoimmune doctor and they said, it's your autoimmune, um, you have an autoimmune deficiency. So they wanted to give me a transfusion. And they're like, it means that basically they're going to plug me in and replace all my um, cells in my body for healthy cells. Because they're like, no, 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 this will fix your gut. It's because it's your immune system that's bad. Now, the truth is, now that I've realized, it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. My gut's bad, so my immune system's horrible. Um, And so when Tom heard that, he's like, babe, like, that doesn't feel right. Because it was like a six-month thing. Gosh, good. Thank God you decided that that wasn't right. 
Because it would, you could have just ended up back where you were. Oh, mm-hmm. 100%. Yeah. I was a week away from getting it done. And Tom was like, no, this doesn't feel right. Let's go into the R&D department of Quest. Let's really sit down with the team and go over like what we can do. And everyone's verdict was like, okay, well, maybe if it's a keto, you go on a ketogenic diet, it will um, calm down the inflammation in your digestion, which would then allow you to eat. So... I went on a strict ketogenic diet and I was like, even if it gives me a stomach upset, I've just got to have to like swallow it, like literally. Mm. Um, And within three days, I felt incredibly better. Mm. Um, And then I went into ketosis and I was very strict on a two to one diet for about, I don't know, maybe six months, really strict. But the problem was I was still getting stomach upsets and I couldn't make a correlation, but like between, well, hang on a minute, I'm doing everything right. My blood levels are great. I would test my levels. I was still in ketosis and yet I'm still having digestion issues. Well, now understanding more, um, I just didn't have the right bacteria in my gut. So on a ketogenic diet, you're not eating many vegetables. You're not having a lot of like the fiber. Yeah, prebiotics, they call. And I needed a lot of that. And I wasn't having... I, so the second I would have an artificial sweetener or the second I would have something that was slightly different, my gut wasn't prepared to fight it. So I realized, okay, ketogenics isn't just the answer. It's only part of it. Mm. Well, did, now what about the emotional or, or mental uh, effects from this? Because you talked about the physical effects of the cramping and digestive mm-hmm. issues. And by the way, this is an interesting subject for me personally because I went through a very similar uh, oh. story to yours. Um, but... And so I also noticed looking back, I didn't realize it at the time, but because the physical effects are so obvious, right? Like mm-hmm. I can't keep any food down. Right. I'm losing weight. Like that's very obvious. But there were also lots of emotional, like anxiety. Uh, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't feel as energetic. I couldn't sleep as good. I started getting, you know, almost m- more paranoid than I normally would. Were you experiencing anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm not a crier. And then all of a sudden I started crying for no reason. Mm. And I was like, hmm, this in, like that completely shocked Tom as well because he's known me as not really an emotional crier and um, and so one day I remember we were at Quest and he said something in a meeting and it really upset me and everybody left and afterwards I was like you really hurt my feelings and I was getting myself all worked up and he just looked at me and he's like what is going on and I was like but you were really rude and he's like like no something's going on you're not normally this emotional I'm like what do you mean I'm not emotional right like and you push back because you're like no what are you talking about um and I started to cry and he's like babe you never cry he's like I love you so much but this is not you and I was like you're right like the emotions feel so real to me mm-hmm. because they are right like mm-hmm. my chemicals are telling me you are upset and all right I'm upset but I I don't need to succumb to them and that's what I realized <clears throat> So that was a big thing where I was like, wow, this is like come out of the blue, didn't see it coming. But as long as I'm talking about it with Tom and I would break it down on days where I'd feel like righteous in my being upset and I'd be like, okay, I'm feeling like this. I need your um, unbiased opinion because I, I know I can't trust myself, right? I know I can't trust this emotion. I know I can't trust if I'm feeling anxious. I My, I, my mind understands it but my body can't get on the same page mm-hmm. so i need someone who is what we call sober you know quite <laughs> unquote sober emotionally to really let me know like am i imagining this and so i would turn to him and he was my sober companion and every time i would feel like that's a lot of trust and that's fan- that's great mm-hmm. and that it, it is a lot of trust 100 percent, because you have to make sure that they're not going to use it to their advantage mm-hmm. right it's like well there are some times where i'm like no this is actually happening i'm i think you actually were wrong here and he'd be like but that's your emotions talking now what do you do in that case where you're like no it's not my emotions yeah. talking i know when it's it my can emotions. feel invalidating right yeah and those were invalidating it's perfect word and I felt invalidated and so I had to navigate that as well because he would be like look you've told me that you need you know that you can trust me this is one of those moments and I just had to take a deep breath and go okay I trust you and then I would reassess right once my emotions had calmed down whether it was a few hours later or the next day I would go okay back then when he said it was my emotions was it actually my emotions now that I'm in the sober moment and I'm like, yeah, that was, okay, that's another tick. I can 
trust, right? Mm. So it kind of just is positive reinforcement that I could keep turning to him because he was very um, good at recognizing those mm. things. Were you still trying to maintain mm. this this strength when uh, you know you're working at Quest, like going through all this stuff, and you know amidst you know all these employees and um, like how did you hold yourself together through all that? Yeah, I didn't tell anyone. So my husband knew a couple of people from the R&D department who were helping me, but I didn't want to seem weak. And like looking back now, I actually don't think that was a good strategy. Mm. I think that you can really empower people by showing them when you're vulnerable Mm -hmm. um, and showing that you trust them to not use that vulnerability against you. But at the time I was just like, stay strong, stay hard. Mm. Um, But again, going back to kind of going from the housewife to the entrepreneur, this hardened me even more Mm. because I didn't want to be vulnerable in in front of people. And I didn't want people to see when I was hurting. And there were days where I'd have to do it, let's say I'd have a test and I had to fast. So I'm now here fasting 24 hours. I haven't eaten. I go to work. I'm getting like headed, but you're in in production. You can't seem like you're sitting on the sofa, like lazy. So it was really tough to kind of um push through it but I'm the type of person that I don't want to look at my weaknesses in that moment because I worry that it could make me weaker Mm. if I focus on the positive I focus on the strength then I feel strong but I I think it's really with anybody right perspective is everything absolutely Lisa what what do you what how do you define success what do you think success is to you doing something you love every single day Mm. Actually, no, that's probably BS. I'm going to take that back. Oh, I love because, that. Because the truth is... Love I the honesty there. Yeah, like as I was saying that, I was like, I, I love what I do, but there are days that I hate what I do, but it's in service of what the final goal, which is what I love. Yeah. Mm. So that's actually more accurate. Doing something every day that is moving you towards something that you actually love. Meaning. Mm. Yeah, meaning, you want to have yeah, meaning. Yeah, Absolutely. exactly. One of the things that we like so much about Tom is he's, he seems like a, gen, like a genuine individual. He seems like he's got... He's brutally honest, lots of integrity. You come across the same way. Like, I feel like you're just, you're very honest. You're going to say, and you live very honestly. When you're in this situation where your health is declining and you can't consume the product that you're selling, how do you rectify those two? Because it feels, I could see how that can be a conflict, mm-hmm. right? Like, okay. You probably feel like an imposter. Yeah, I can't. This product destroys me and makes me feel terrible, but we're selling it as a health product. Mm. Are you ignoring that or how are you dealing with that? How's that rectifying? Yeah. So when this all first started happening, I remember taking an Instagram post and it was um, it was when we came out with the pumpkin pie bar. So this is how long ago it was, a few years back. And I couldn't try it. And so everyone was celebrating. We did like this big production, our biggest production, you know, that I was so excited about and proud, but I still couldn't try the bar. And everyone was posting about it. So I'm like, I'm going to post about it. So I took a photo of the bar pretending that I was eating it for breakfast. And I felt so bad because like you oh, said, like I, I yeah. only like to be honest. I think BSing people doesn't serve anyone, <clears throat> um, doesn't set them up for success. And so I just felt really bad about myself. Like here I am um, not telling my employees how I'm actually feeling, pretending on social media that I'm, you know, eating this bar when I can't even try it. And I really had to figure out what I was about and what was the most meaning to me. And the biggest thing for me is about being honest. And when I realized, you know what, you even said earlier, so many people now are suffering from microbiome issues Mm -hmm. that instead of trying to pretend that everything's okay, own up to it because it's not the Quest Bar that did it to me. It's just I can't consume it now. But if I don't speak up about what's actually happening, I can't actually then help someone. Right? And it's like, if this feels like an epidemic and if it is and what how can you make the best the, sorry the worst situation the best situation and it's like okay well if i can take all this shit that's happened with my microbiome and make like actually make a difference to one two different people that don't have to do and go through what i've done then it's worth it then that way surpasses my own ego that way surpasses what people think of me about being a co-founder of quest nutrition like i had to just become okay with that and say you know haters will always hate and the people that I actually am helping um, that's where I get my true joy from and so if I can help one or two people what that's you beautiful and, you know, on a, from a, on a psychological perspective uh, when people make small omissions of truth or small even out blatant you know lies those actually start to change who you become to the mm-hmm. point where when you need to have character and stand your ground, 
you're now weak. There's a famous study done, and I think it was in Stanford that they did in 1970s, and actually they had to discontinue the study, and I don't think they'll ever be able to do it again, but they had students pretend to be guards and some students pretend to be prisoners. I don't know if you saw this. I, I've heard of it, but yeah. And, and the behavior of these students mm. started, the, the guards started acting you know, like masochists, you know, and, and started being very abusive. And the ones who pretended to be guards, uh, to be prisoners, excuse me, allowed this horrible, you know, treatment of themselves and started to feel differently about themselves. And it all started with these small pretending, you know, kind of lies. They had to end the study, even though all the students could have stopped yeah. at that moment. And we've got, you know, we see this throughout all of history where you get, you know, people to to not tell the truth or lie a little bit. And before you know it, they like stand for nothing and it can be, it can poison you. It can be a very difficult thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I understand what you're talking about, what you're going through and how difficult that was. Did that start to mold? Cause there's a huge market for it too. Now the capitalist in me thinks, holy cow, you've got some gut issues and you've got a company that is, you know, worth a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. This is a huge market. There's a lot of people that might, right, did you, opportunity there. Huge, there might be a huge opportunity. Did you start to think, wow, maybe we can, cater to this or change the product or try this, uh, you know, thing to work with, you know, situations like my own? Um, absolutely. When it came to ketogenic products, mm. because that the studies were coming out more and more about what the ketogenic diet was doing for cognition, for weight loss, for inflammation. It was just incredible. So behind the scenes, yeah, we were working hard on the keto on ketogenic products. Um, but, to be honest, like as we were doing more and more research and understanding how complex the microbiome is, like how complex, it's insane mm -hmm. that right now, I don't know if any food can solve it, right? It's like my diet now consists of introducing one new ingredient a week. And so it's to the point where it's like, I have to try one carrot, one bite of a carrot one day. The second day is two bites of a carrot. The third day is three bites of a tiny little carrot. And so how does... It was hard to kind of then say, how do you connect that with a product that's going to have the magic right. um, solution? And so I think that that is really difficult in that arena. And then also Quest always took a stand from, we're never going to preach, right? Diet and, you know, in general has almost become like a religion. Oh, totally. Where if you're like, you you know, you talk badly about a vegan, a, if you fit your macros or meat eating, like doesn't matter what your diet is. If you talk to someone and you say why it's not right, they get defensive. Oh, yeah. So it becomes like religion. And the one thing very early on, um, we all realized that Quest is we can't be preachers of what people should eat. We can only offer the product and let other people make the choice. Mm. So um, it was always kind of from that standpoint, okay, we'll make the product, we'll make it, you know, up to like the best standard we possibly can mm. at, you know, a, a rate that we can actually afford to, you know, make good quality bars because that was also important of having our own morals and making sure that we didn't downgrade the quality of the product. Um, but yeah, we never really were like, okay, we need to make this so that we can push it on this community. Yeah, yeah it's all, and you obviously took, made the right decision. Uh, the success speaks for, its, uh, for itself. Um, changing gears now, let's talk about what you guys are doing now because mm -hmm. when I came to your house, I don't know how long ago was that, Adam? That was uh, about eight months ago. About eight months was it ago. Really that long ago? Yeah, yeah wow. about eight months ago. This is when Tom was doing the, the launch of Modius or mm -hmm. talking about it. Your house, beautiful home, a lot of it looks like a movie set, like in your house. <laughs> How? What is that like? Because I know you're yeah. the you're the the who decided to alpha do that, the home. Yeah, like, yeah. How do you yeah. deal with that? Like you you literally live in your work uh, uh, for a lot of your home, right? What's yeah. that like? Um, it was weird at first because you're having you know your house is full of 12, 14 people on a daily basis, and everyone walks into different rooms, and they walk into your you know living room, and your um. So it was very weird at first, but I think it always came down to what's our What's our goal? What's our mission? As a couple, right? Me and Tom, as a family, what is that goal? Okay, it's to actually create impact on people, to really show that the mindset is holding you back. Okay, well, what is that going to take? Okay, it means content, right? As you guys know, content, it can reach so many people that um, it's a very powerful tool. 
So, okay, we need to be able to do content. Okay, well, if his time is very valuable, every second he ever spends getting in the car, myself included, is time away that you could be creating something. Okay, so if that is taking time, how do you expedite that? Okay, well, if we had the studio in the house, you just walk down the stairs and you're on set. Okay, well, but I don't really want 30 people shooting in my house. Okay, well, maybe it'll just be temporary. Um, So we literally was like, okay, it's just going to be temporary. And then we realized, wow, as a... To work towards our mission, if we really believe it and we're really trying to get to that goal, this is what it's going to have to take. It's going to have to take building studios in your house. It's going to have to take making sure that every minute of your time is accounted for and that it's not wasted. And Tom, going back to, you know, when he wanted to start Quest initially, it's like, I I, I bet on him. Mm. Like, I believe in him as a visionary. I believe in him to lead the family. And so when he has this vision and understanding of this is what it's going to have to take, I'm on board. Let's do it. It's got to kill day sex, though, huh? (laughs) It does somewhat. Or improve it with the cameras. I I was going to say, now you've got six cameras (laughs) on you, baby. (laughs) Oh, wow. The weekends are fun. (laughs) You know that chair you're sitting on over there? Yeah. Let's talk about some of the sets in your home, because when we were there, there was one main set, and I think it was the Impact Theory Mm -hmm. uh, set, but you... You've since added more. We have. And again, this goes to Tom. I, and I just love his crazy ideas. Like I'm so bought in. It's like we're so kind of crazy. And it's like, why not? Who cares? Like who says that's wrong? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was like, okay, we needed more sets to do. We wanted to do different content. And of course, Tom was like, okay, babe, just, you know, get a couple of chairs and make the set look, you know, make the room look nice. And so again, he's a vis- visionary. I'm the executor. So I'll go out. And I, I started doing this design and getting like nice chairs. And, and I did this whole layout and I show it to him. And he's like, I'm not Martha Stewart. <laughs> and I'm like, but what do you mean? He's like, you've done like these like really fluffy chairs and like it looks like a living room. I'm like, but that's what you said. And he's like, no, 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 no. It needs like neon lights and it needs like this and that. And I'm like, okay, so you want to build a set? And he's like, well, look into it. And, you know, to cut a long story short, a month later, we've got four new sets. So one that ended up being a couple of couches and a backdrop is now four sets. We built four different walls so that you could um, angle the camera in different ways and it looked like a new set. Oh, that's cool. Um, which meant that my poor mother-in-law's um, bedroom had to be converted. We took her bed out. My sister-in-law's bedroom has been converted, took her bed out. So it's like literally like we each room is now being taken over one by one one and then the other day someone made a joke about turning our tv room into something and i was like yeah it probably will happen <laughs> like as long as i draw the line at my bedroom yeah. like that is it just give me my bedroom put a microwave and a fridge in my bedroom and i'm fine <laughs> you know nice tv and i'm good um but i just think like when you have a vision or when you have a um just a goal in life in general you have to really ask yourself like what is it going to take to get there and are you actually willing mm-hmm. to do it because i never want to turn around and say oh, well, poor me, why didn't it work? Like, it should have, I can't believe I failed. It's like, no, I gave it my all. I was all in. And I think that that's kind of the attitude you have to have. We had that request and we have that uh, impact theory. So if that means, like, taking over my entire house to get to our goal, then, yeah, heck, let's do it. Having having that uh, that attitude, what do you think is your, your greatest fear? Hmm. My greatest fear... With that attitude specifically? Yeah, just with the, I mean, you've already been a part of building a, a huge company already. You guys are now in the middle of building another huge company. Right. What is your greatest fear when you look at that? I mean, I think that we could lose it all. You know, like we spent over a year not monetizing our content whatsoever. So Tom and I sat down and we said, how much money are we willing to put towards this cause of, you know, really creating impact? And what does that look like? Um, so let's share a little bit about that because a lot of people don't know that you guys are doing that. And I, I do, I've talked to Tom all the time and that takes a lot of balls to do that, to be able to put that much money that I know you guys have invested Mm. in this business and not turn the light switch on to monetize. So talk about why you guys did that and what that looks like for you. So once Quest became extremely successful, it's kind of like you always think like, oh, I've got what I've always dreamed for and mm-hmm. life's going to be amazing. But the truth is both Tom and I are like, what, what's next kind of people? Um, and so I really, having a background of film and media, like 
when I started building the media department, I was like, this is exciting. This is what I've always wanted to do. I built a studio. I'm creating content. Um, we had a, tra- a tra- show called Transformation that was really highlighting people's lives. And it was really meaningful to me. And it was meaningful, I think, to a lot of people that watched the show. Um, but also that what came with that was the general stuff that you have to do to run a company it's the commercials it's you know doing fun things to promote the product and I started realizing my heart's not in that Mm. and then that really made me assess like what am I actually working this hard for and it was to really create impact and to really affect people's lives and when I realized that my time every day was being spent less and less on that and it was being spent more and more on helping the company just get more profitable um which of course it needs to be and i you know love that and i love how big the company's gotten but that wasn't what was satisfying anymore and so i really had to acknowledge that and say okay this isn't fulfilling me anymore and the same with tom like tom realized very quickly that um wow we've bought this massive company and yet his mum and my mum are still severely overweight you can literally, I try to throw money at my mom, like, mom, I'll like hire a chef. I'll get you this food, like whatever it will take. I'll get you a personal trainer. And she was putting on more weight, the more successful Quest got. And so was Tom's mom. So that was like a big bell that was like, hang on a minute. Quest is great for the people that already are there mentally to want to change their lives. But what are the people who aren't there yet? What are the people that need help switching on that light bulb in the brain? Because I think it has to start there. Mm. Um, and so we were really assessed, okay, well, what are we doing this for? We've, you know, been very fortunate with the success of the company. We've now got financial stability. What do we actually want to do with that financial, st- you know, that financial side of things? And it was like, literally, on one hand, do we go and just say, fuck it, let's go buy an island and drink margaritas our entire lives? Because we literally had that discussion. <laughs> what does that life look like? And I said, we were like, well, we'd be miserable after two weeks. I'd be so bored. Mm-hmm. Like I'd be counting the sand grains, you know, like <laughs> I'd be so bored. So it's like, okay, so what's that other thing that, that right now we're not being fulfilled? And it was like, we're not affecting the people who need the help with the mind. Mm. So we're like, well, screw it. I don't need a big house. I don't need a, you know, a big yacht or anything. It's like, I'll get bored of that very quickly. So let's take that money and actually make a difference. And so what does that look like? And it became impact theory. So what does the monetization look like in the future? Because I know, I mean, you guys had a quarter million people on YouTube. I know about how much revenue that is. That wouldn't even come close to paying your electric bill. Uh, I, I know that, I mean, I know he, you guys started selling shirts not that long ago, which mm-hmm. I know what that produces. That would not Peanuts. even, right, yeah. exactly. So you guys really aren't, mon- even though you have some monetization yeah. going on, anybody who knows uh, what it takes to build something that big, that doesn't even come close to supporting the staff right. that you guys have. So what is the plan to, to, to turn on the money and how to actually support the business? Yeah, so we've recently um, turned on YouTube ads. Um, that's been one thing that we, and we explained to our audience why we were doing it. Because again, I think you just need to be very transparent. Right. And it's like, I'm, we're not trying to trick anyone. Like the truth is we put every penny over off, over a year. We had, you know, 12 staff members and a show, a main show that is, you know, in my opinion, extremely um well put together um that is not cheap let me tell you right. um and so after a year we're like okay how do we sustain this it's not even about recouping our money back right it's about how do we keep doing this for the next year and then after we figured out how we do sustain it how do we then do have wealth creation because i think that is important because we when then want to use that wealth to put back into the community and what we're doing but i think it's important like you need the money to create the content And so if someone thinks like, oh, well, you're trying to sell shirts to make money, like you're not rich enough, it's like, then you don't get what we're trying to do. Of course not. And if you actually knew how much money you're (laughs) probably making. Yeah, yeah, if you've ever tried to sell a shirt. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, we are looking at what that looks like this year and then what that looks like next year. Um, So we've done a few, like you said, selling shirts, YouTube ads, things like that. We're now putting um, ads on our podcast. Um, so there's a few little things that we're doing, but the bigger picture, we're trying to build a studio. Um, and I know we were talking earlier about the matrix and mm-hmm. how much it's impacted people's lives and, you know, what that is meaning, to, what that means to people. 
and we realize that there's entertainment that can really affect you on a mental level, right? With superhero movies. When I went and saw Wonder Woman, like I've, I felt badass, like leaving that place. Like it can really change your chemicals in your body. And so understanding that entertainment can do that, nonfiction and fiction can do that. Um, sorry, fiction can do that. Like, okay, well, what does that then look like if we're the Disney of impact? Mm. so you know Disney you know exactly what you're going to get you know you can take your kids to watch it you don't have to worry in any way shape or form what it's going to be about you know the feeling um, that's what we want to do with impact theory is create fictional entertainment that you know when you come and watch our movie read our comic book watch our animation that you're going to be empowered but it's still going to be freaking fun and entertaining and so and- is that the ultimate vision for how you would monetize too then which is similar to disney which is you build this ginormous network of people and then where the real money probably comes in is dolls and action figures. Exactly. The merchandise is really where they make the money. So um, the problem, though, is with the studio model right now is you put almost all your eggs in one basket, mm-hmm. right? It's like you spend $100 million on a movie and hope it hits. And if it doesn't, then you crumble, mm-hmm. right? And it's like we don't want to get in that situation. So for us, like the community is a big deal for us because we want to make sure that what we're doing is actually serving the community. Um, versus just take rolling the dice and taking a gamble it's like you can do pieces of content and see what resonates with people mm. you can do a comic book you can do a short film you can do an animated series and then see how your community is responding and are they saying wow this really affected me or are they, they saying this was a waste of my time um so slowly building that up in that way is really the you, got, the path. you guys have you honed in on any winners yet like any any um pieces of content you guys are super excited about that's like okay this is going to be a long term uh, you know uh, story with us um yeah, so um, initially the the plan was to having people on our main show, Impact Theory, and then seeing whose episodes resonate with people mm. and then talking to them about making deals and potentially doing a fictionalized version of their story. Mm. So you've got Goggins, for instance, right? Um, don't know if you guys ever saw the episode of David Goggins, but that like smashed it and went mm-hmm. viral on Facebook and on YouTube. and. Um, and so, okay, well, he's a great episode. And as a character, um, maybe if you fictionalize him a little, because I think you almost have to, to be in, like that entertaining to sure. kind of do the, the superhero-esque um, character, I guess. Um, yeah, so we were like, okay, well, he's clearly resonated with people. So what if what would he look like if he was an animated series? Oh, how cool. This started to make more sense. I think I was trying to wrap my brain around what your guy's vision was with right. this company because it's, it's kind of tough to wrap my brain around. But yeah, so you're bringing people in, you're understanding their story, what resonates with your audience, and then you might build some form of a, a story around. So that. that's how you're using the YouTube right now. So when you guys... Correct. Oh, that's really interesting. So we want to start dabbling. Um, not sure how much I'm allowed to reveal <laughs> reveal right now, but we're in deals of a comic book deal with a, um, A-list massive celebrity um, that has really impacted people. So, um, you know, it's our mission to try and take their story and you know really use that in an entertaining way and they're all for it and they're super excited and Tom's friends with them so um, our first step will be a comic book that we're hoping to release um, in probably around three to six months we're working on it oh now. wow that's this nice is, yeah. this is brilliant because you guys uh, you're in uh, LA but you've got the studio in your home you're producing your content for the new media which mm-hmm. is internet and whatever And it's, I think you guys are ahead of the curve, but I feel like a lot of people are going to start trying to do what you guys are doing. Um, And it's also potentially- (laughs) Good luck trying to catch up. It's also- (laughs) I love the competition. (laughs) Good luck trying to catch up, dude. It's also potentially disruptive, right? To an industry that is totally, like, it's it's entrenched in it. Yeah, and in the old ways of doing things. Have, are, I don't know. I don't think. Have you guys gotten pushback yet, or, or is it oh, too early? Oh, every right. wo- step really? of the way, of really? course. Um, and the funny thing is, when you've got like a notch under your belt, like Quest for us was like the ground of like no one believed that it would work. Everyone told us we were crazy. Everyone looked like an, an establishment, right? There's already been said protein bars can't be made like that. You either have to eat cardboard or you have, you know, something that is like got hidden sugars in it, and like this bar cannot exist. Um, and so we went in and completely disrupt the industry because we were naive enough to say, well, why can't it work? Mm-hmm. 
Um, and I think you almost need that disruption of a um, industry that has been just like just rooted for so many years in one way. Yeah. Unchallenged. You, unchallenged, exactly. And it's like the world is different now when, you know, Disney was built and when all the studios were built, like there was no social media like it's mm -hmm. like today. So you have to move with the times and understanding social media and understanding that your community that you're building is your audience. And you can get real time feedback, which you couldn't once upon a time when you build built a studio. But it's still archaic because they're still not really doing it. I mean, you look at the social medias of like all these studios and they're not massive. No, they, it's a big ship. Yeah. It's a big ship. It's hard to turn and uh, people are arrogant. You don't want, if you've been doing something for so long that's been working, you, I mean, there's the famous story of Net Netflix getting laughed out of uh, the blockbuster Oh, I offices. love that so much. Right? Like yes. had they had they had they not been so arrogant, they would have seen right in front of them like yes. we need to pivot because we're about right. to be screwed. I just literally this is so funny. I just canceled cable, right? So I have cable at home with all the channels and my kids watch YouTube and Netflix and Hulu. They could yeah. give a shit. Like, what are we cable. doing anymore? So yeah. I call them I call them up to cancel and they're trying to prevent me from canceling. Oh, it's and I'm like, why would I keep your service when you guys are more expensive and nobody cares and the guy on the other line was getting offended and he's like no and I had to show him statistics I'm like actually you guys are bleeding you lost 22 million customers last year <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. and we're going back and forth and I mean you guys you I can't think of a better example of the new guard than you guys because we've been watching what you're doing I'm like this is the future like it's not going to be the old guard is not, it's too expensive it's too slow mm -hmm. and it's going to get out competed and they are they're pretending like that's not going to happen we were when we go down to LA we see Netflix uh, movie you yeah, know posters now yeah. every billboard at the movies I saw a, a commercial for a YouTube mm -hmm. movie the other day it's like oh shit man if you don't recognize it now you're mm -hmm. dead and you guys are definitely on that that cutting edge which is exciting because I think it opens the door for it's the the barrier to enter is lower or at least it's it's not that it's going to be like you still got to be good but the barrier to enter the market before was so high. Like if I wanted to get on a radio show, but I mean, I have a podcast. I'm one of the top fitness podcasts in the country. Before, this would have been impossible. Nobody would have given me the time of day or I would have had to sell my soul to, yeah. to lie and sell products mm -hmm. I don't believe in in order just to get an opportunity. I mean, it's, it's excellent. It's awesome that you guys have this and you have these people coming in who, uh, I mean, where are you looking for Cause I know you're working with A-list celebrities, but where else are you looking for breakthroughs? Are you getting through your social media or? Um, yeah. So an A-list isn't necessarily a must for us. It's really kind of like, we want to make noise. So it's, you know, having an A-list that helps do that. Yeah. It helps the mission. Um, but I think it's important, like in, general to like just make sure that it all comes back to are we telling an empowering story because that has to be your guiding force because it's like I don't care if you're an A-list if you don't have something impactful for our community because it's the community we are serving then it doesn't matter so um yeah, really, I think social helps us establish, like mainly on Tom Social, um, helps us establish what is resonating with people and what isn't. Um, you know, and it, it, it helps guide. It mm. helps put like the the what they called, you know, this things in the bowling alleys. Yeah. The, bumper <laughs> the, bumper the bumpers, thing. thank yeah. you. Um, but sometimes Tom loves to remove the bumpers completely. You know, it's like that happy midway where sometimes you need them and then sometimes you've got to get rid of them. Mm. What, is there a story, a particular story that you personally would like to see succeed or anything like, you know? Mm, not really. I think from a personal um, level, I really do um, love the female empowerment empowerment movement. Yeah, you talked about Wonder Woman. Yeah. My daughter left that movie like I'd never seen her before. Yeah. I loved it. And I just think it's amazing. And I think it's... Um, yeah, it's just empowering for women. And, um, you know, when I talk about female empowerment, and it's, I've heard other people talk where it kind of like brings the guy down or, you know, tries to um, diminish the guy's value and bring the, the women up. And I, I don't see female empowerment like that at all. I just think it's recognizing the strength that women have within themselves. Um, and I wish I had an avenue for that when I was 11, when I was 12, where there were more women 
being visible, talking openly um, about the real stuff. Because I think, like, while I love Wonder Woman, it is not a reality in any way, shape or form. Like, I can't use necessarily those skill sets in the, sh- the movie mm-hmm. to actually apply to my real life. You know, how do I overcome food issues? How do I overcome insecurity as a woman? Like, all these things that I think... Um, can make you feel powerful when you watch something like Wonder Woman, but they don't actually touch on the everyday, um, how do I put that into my real life? And that's why I actually love things like what you guys are doing, like coming on the podcast and talking with you guys and having the discussion, like talking real to me is the one thing that sets me on fire. Um, Speaking of your 11 and 12 year old self, I'd love to hear what you think are your greatest attributes that you've picked up from your parents and maybe some that you would like to get rid of? Hmm. That picked up from my parents. I'm not... Well, so, okay, well, here's something real. My mom had eating issues growing up, and I saw that, and she pretended she didn't. And for a long time, I didn't realize what was right or normal. And so my mom went from um, being some... Oh God, I think I would call her like anorexic. I mean, she you know didn't eat much and I saw her wither away when she divorced my dad to then all of a sudden ballooning up and becoming overweight. Mm. So this super unhealthy relationship with food growing up, like it never dawned on me that I should question it. It was just like, this is how women normal. eat. Yeah, yeah normal. Um, but... I think that can be is my one of my biggest blessings because I think having seen that, having completely ruined my digestion, I think because I had bad um, guidelines, um, it's put me in the position of who I am today and how I feel about myself today. And I don't think I would be here if I didn't struggle with all of that. Um, and I know um, I said this earlier and it really is from Tony Robbins where it's like, how can you take the worst thing and make it the best? And so I can look back at all my bad eating habits and look back at how much I was destroying my body um, and be um, scarred by it and really like make that like embedded as an identity. Or I can say, this doesn't define me. I've learned so much from this. I can be stronger and I'm going to use this as my strength now. And so I, I hope that answered your question. I guess I learned that from my mom. And well, what about it? What about a characteristic trait or habit that you would like to get rid of? Okay, um, that is probably I have a hard time when people um, disrespect either me or other people around me. Um, and Tom is very much like his motto is you need to accept people for who they are. Like, why are you always surprised by it? I think that's a big thing. Like, if I know someone can always be somewhat cruel or mean and they are again, I still get hurt and upset and I get a bit righteous in like, I'm going to tell them what I think because that's not right. And he's like, but why are you surprised by it? Like, the last time you saw them, they did exactly the same thing. Yeah. You know, and I get all my, my myself emotionally worked up over it. And I really would like to let go of that because I don't want to, I don't think it, I should let other people influence my emotions like that. Yeah. Um, and so I need to d- uh, distance myself. And when I see someone who is being either disrespectful or isn't treating someone in a right way, um, that's not even the right way of saying it. If somebody is, let's say they're dismissive, um, maybe they don't mean to be rude, but they're dismissive with you. I would still get annoyed by it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would let that really affect me emotionally. And it would like then kind of infect everything I was doing that day. Instead of going, okay, that's them. I don't like, I won't allow that to influence me. I won't allow that to make me feel worse about myself. Um, and yeah, I need to let go of that. When you, when you unpack that, where do you think it comes from? Ooh. I think, so when I was younger, I got um, picked on a lot at school. Mm. So, um, you know, I had a unibrow, I had the frizzy hair, I got, you know, made fun of a lot. And so I think I became very sensitive to how people spoke to me Mm. and how if somebody made fun of me, it made me feel less than and made them seem um, like on a pedestal. Um, I, I think I, I would even put them in a pedestal, right? Like, wow, they're strong. Like, they're, they don't care what people think. You know, even if they were being horrible, um, I think I had a, yeah, like a weird view of that. And so I think growing up, I became sensitive to it. So anytime somebody was dismissive or was rude or was inappropriate, I felt like immediately that made me feel like less than. Mm. 
Yeah, what's the old saying? Don't cast pearls before swine. I, I that's for when I, I had the same issue mm-hmm. where I'd want to like teach people, mm-hmm. and I'm like, they're right. not going to listen to what I'm saying. Like, yeah. why am I wasting my energy? And where's that coming from? It would make me feel temporarily better, but not really. I'd end up feeling worse yeah. as a result. So, you you talk a lot about you know talked about women empowerment. Uh, you talked about. Um, you know what you went through as a kid, being bullied, and now wanting to speak out. Do you, where do you see a lot of the challenges uh, with women today? Is it with food? Is it with you know body image and self image? Yeah, I mean, I think it's all of the above. I think social media hasn't necessarily helped, but I am not looking to bash social media because I feel like it has brought more. Um, joy to my life than negative um i think you just need to know when to switch off like i do not follow people that don't make me feel good i don't follow fake mm-hmm. people um i know that about myself so sure social media can be bad but you're the one that's controlling it right and i think that's the biggest thing like you under- said empowerment that's empowering right exactly yeah. like having the control over what is you're bringing into your world is very important um and i just think that yeah people So I think people see unhealthy habits, right? They see people saying like, look how skinny I am. And I'm actually quite, I get torn about showing ab shots um, because I work really hard for my abs. Like I bust myself, you know, bust my ass in the gym to get abs. And so I think it can be empowering to say, hey, if you dedicate yourself, then you can achieve this. But at the same time, I don't want to... um, dismiss the fact that I have health issues and that the foods that I eat and the way my digestion is now um, is actually it's helping my abs look great but it's not helping me get healthy so there's that like this weird like phase that I'm in now where it's like I want to empower people to say you can take control of this but also I don't like talking about necessarily my own diet because I have such a difficult time with what I have to eat based on getting myself healthy or not um so yeah so I think body image food diet all of that is um rather um difficult I think as a female but the biggest thing that I've learned is accepting the truth, right? Like, I think for me, at least, I have a voice in my head that says, oh, if you do that, is that going to keep your abs? I have the voice. I can't switch the voice off no matter how much I've tried, no matter how much I've like told myself, like, ignore, like, don't listen to it, ignore it. The truth is the voice is there. Now I think the empowerment is what do you do with that voice? And for me, it's been to talk, to speak openly about the fact that, yes, I have that voice in my head. I'm only human. I have that um, thing that's telling me to not do this or to do this. But I have the control. And it is completely up to me whether I listen to the voice, whether I turn the voice down or not, or whether I ignore it. But I don't want to pretend anymore that that isn't there. You know, that body, that my abs don't matter to me. Yes, my abs matter to me. But I'm not going to let that dictate what I eat. Mm. So I'm not pretending that it doesn't matter to me anymore, which I used to. And I think a lot of women try to do. Like there's people that say like, oh, just love your body for how it is. That's great in theory. But I'm guessing most people who do that also have that voice in their head, right? That's telling them not to eat this or not to do this or to do, you know, work out, jump on the treadmill Mm. for three hours because you just had that donut. Okay, well, the voice is there. Welcome the voice. Just don't listen to it. Mm. Yeah, we just I, I just recently read a quote that was so powerful. It was actually in a book I'm reading right now and it's care for yourself like you would care for someone that you that you loved. Mm. And so what does that mean? That means that it doesn't mean you give yourself everything you want all the time. You wouldn't right. do that with a kid. You wouldn't just give your kid everything they wanted. You want them to be challenged. You want to sometimes say no, sometimes you say yes, and that's kind of how so when people confuse the like love yourself with the oh, I just love my body how it is type of deal. No, really loving yourself is also being objective. Like you can look in the mirror, care about yourself and say, wow, I'm, I don't display good health right now. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean you don't love yourself. Mm-hmm. It actually means the opposite. It means you do love yourself. Um, and that's a, uh, I think it's a, it's a paradigm shift for people. Once you make that paradigm shift, things become a little bit more, I guess a little bit more clear. And then the other side of that is the discussions that you have with yourself. I think sometimes when we're thinking, we have that voice that says one thing and then we try to create, because that's how what's what thinking is, right? You got one voice and you try to create another side to argue it. But sometimes we create the other side so that we know it's going to lose. Like we're not really, mm, it's a false 
conversation. It's propaganda. We know that it's a straw man. Like, you know, my abs are the super important to me. And then you create this other side that's not really going to win. And we know it, but it puts up en- enough of a fight for us to be like, I thought about it. But, you know, so it's I really, love it's, that. That's interesting. I never it, thought of that. It's, it's self. Uh, you're talking about truth. Mm. Uh, the, the biggest lies we do are, are not to other people or to ourselves. Yeah. And so that's a big one. I've, I've, fallen for that myself or I know what I need to do I create this false argument that I overcome myself but I knew I would anyway it wasn't a real argument and you just end up you know doing what you were going to do anyway and I've desperately tried not to fall into that trap because I have like these two competing goals and dreams and desires right one is to have like six pack abs because I've always wanted them and the other one is to get healthy and what happens when your two desires come into collision right so I've, I'm having to do these new foods these new diets and um, the Viome people are really helping me eat like mm-hmm. um, give a food plan and in the food plan there are foods that I would never normally eat, like watermelon now I freaking love watermelon but I've always seen it as like nature's candy um, <laughs> with you know if you're trying to get vitamins and things like that okay have vegetables have other things but watermelon is not your go wasn't hasn't been my Mm go-to food and so that was on my list of foods that I need to eat and for a split second I hesitated and that hesitation was like oh this isn't going to do my physique any good now again going back to the voice I just welcomed it and I was like okay recognize that it's you hesitated but why? Okay, what are my competing ideas? I want six-pack abs and I want to get healthy. Okay, well, now I understand that. What is actually my final goal? If I have to choose one, well, it's, it's health 100%. I will take my health over abs any day. So if I've put those into conflict and I realize, okay, this one is definitely the one that I want more. The voice is coming in. You know, oh, hey, should you eat this? Now I have the answer. Hell yes, I'm going to eat this. Mm. Because it's serving my final goal. And my final goal is health, not abs. Mm-hmm. So understanding those, you know, the competing ideas, the two voices, but knowing when you shouldn't let something control you um, has been so powerful for me. But mm-hmm. I, I love that analogy, though, of like creating a fake voice oh, just so that time. you can say that, no, 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 I did consider it. We <laughs> yeah. you didn't. No, you yeah. didn't. And the, yeah. irony, the irony of it is when, you know, we talk about this all the time on the show. When health is optimal, the physical representation of being healthy looks pretty pretty damn reflect. good. It right. usually looks pretty good. Now, what is the health representation of only chasing cosmetic? Mm-hmm. Many times it's terrible. Right. And then you lose both. Yeah. And so you actually end up in a yeah. situation where you've got nothing. And so it's a false... It's it's a false comparison that I think a lot of us have in our minds where we think it's one or the other when in reality you get a great deal of both when you focus on health and and the the irony is the side effect of that is I I experienced it myself my health rebelled on me very similarly to how yours did and I completely went after health and then I looked better than I ever looked right, before right. on accident. You know, I remember I look in the mirror and be like, this is weird. And yeah. then I'm stronger in the gym than I was before. I'm like, what the fuck's going on right. here? And it was, it was totally yeah. paradigm shattering for me. So, um, but yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a conversation that needs to be had, mm-hmm. but uh, a lot of it is in, is within ourselves. And I think the people that tend to have the most difficulty with that conversation are those of us that represent health and fitness because mm-hmm. it's our business. Right. You know what I mean? And I think it's so important why you're being so, you know, transparent and honest about it because, yeah, I think people want everything all at once, right? They want to be the strongest, the fittest, the healthiest, the with the biggest muscles. And it's like sometimes it just doesn't work like that. And you have to be honest about what takes priority. And then, no, look, down the line, you can get your abs back and you know that you can get stronger. But if you're trying to do both, like you said, it's like you almost end up, doing nothing you get neither you get neither exactly right (laughs) but for me it's like okay do the health first rock that out pride yourself on being the person that is going to set a goal and actually achieving Mm -hmm. it build your self-esteem around that as well once i get healthy then i can change change gears and go okay i know i need to keep my health here but now how do i do this other goal that i really am striving Mm -hmm. for yeah it's uh one of my new motivations is i i've noticed very strongly it's pretty awesome that because it used to be my motivation went was aesthetic then it was don't let my health get bad 
and then my health was really good and I was able to fix that and then I'd kind of play with that a little bit and push it into my health would rebel a little bit and then I go back and forth but now I'm realizing that when I'm healthy I am way more effective in everything else I do like I'm a better podcast host hmm. when I'm feeling really good so it's a new level of right. motivation to maintain good health and as I continue down that path I find more and more things that reinforce it versus the other way around where hmm. I feel like I'm not so yeah. I have a selfish question that I want to ask before we wrap the podcast yeah. up because I totally identify with your guys' relationship and what you guys are currently building. I have a partner that's been together for seven years. I share a lot on the podcast, like different things that we've learned as far as, you know, how do you take two people that are go getters mm-hmm. and can get buried into work and how do you still have a very successful relationship? And we've created some habits and exercises that we do for each other. Can you think of a, a single exercise or habit that you and Tom have done that's been a game changer for strengthening your relationship? Um, the first thing that comes to mind is a game called Selfish Desires that Tom and I play mm, and it that li- sounds fun <laughs> <laughs> but and his it's actually really simple I made it sound like super like ooh <laughs> drum yeah, roll please like where, do we, where do we buy this <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> right, yeah. I can text it to you right now and it's called selfish desire <laughs> um, it's literally sitting down and saying okay I'm not going to be judged the partner's not going to judge me what do you selfishly want to do mm. like don't even think about me Right. If it's like, hey, I want to go off with my mates for three hours and get drunk. Cool. Just be honest. Hmm. Because once you're honest, there's no like having to pander and go around each other. And so it's like, okay. So on a day where it's, let's say, a Saturday and we're like, all right, what's your selfish desire? And he'll say exactly what he wants to do. I'll say exactly what I want to do. And then we figure out how do we both get what we want. Mm. So it's like, okay, he wants to play video games. All right. Now I I love video games. And so I was like, all right, cool. Let's, you know, I really want to play too. So we're aligned there. He wants to read. Eh, I don't really want to read. It's like, I want to go like do something exciting. So then we'll figure out, okay, well, if you want to read... And that's going to be, what, about two hours? I want to go out shopping. All right, so what I'll do is that, you know, 1 p.m., I'll go shopping, babe. You read. And then when we come back, we'll have lunch together and that will be our time together. And Mm -hmm. so we literally just figure out our agendas, like what we're trying to do, what we want to do, and then how we come together and do it. Because the one thing we started to notice is one of us was always giving, not even just giving in. It's like, hang on, I only get three hours of free time and now I have to do what you want to do? Well, that's such a good point right there because that's what happens in a lot of relationships. There tends to be one that kind of just drives or can dominate a relationship and then the other one ends up just kind of always giving in and doesn't get to ever pursue their selfish desires. So I I really like that. And we Mm -hmm. do an exchange. It's like, I want to go shopping. He has no desire to shop, but I really want him to come with. So I'll say, all right, babe, what do you want in return? Hmm. Like, make a deal. All right, what do you want? I like that. And so it's like, so he's like, all right, well, if you do this, then I'll come shopping with you. Great, come shopping with me. And he does it with such excitement. And I then return the favor with such excitement Mm. because you don't want someone that feels like they've been drug along. And it's like, Mm. sure, he may have come shopping with me, but now he's sitting there on his phone and he's not paying attention and he looks miserable. It's like, that's no, it's not enjoyable for me. It's not enjoyable for him. So we've really figured out like how to give each, each other the gifts of the kingdom and feel like our lives aren't being dictated by what the other person wants like you have to be your own person what would you say you visit that like once a week or once a month oh yeah 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 every every whenever we've got date night we always say what's your selfish desire Mm. and look sometimes one of us does give in we're like i don't really want to do that but i can see how happy it's going to make you so yeah let's do it and then you jump on board and you're happy with it and you know you or we try to find ways to do it together like he wants to read but um, I don't really want to read the book he's interested in. So we'll go, all right, well, if this is a time where you just want to activate your brain and, you know, hear stories or anything, what is the book that we can share? And so Ready Player One, I don't know if you guys have read that yet. So we started, he was reading it to me. And so it was like, okay, well, this is where we get to bond because I feel like he's, um, I get to hear his voice, which I love hearing and it feels somewhat intimate. Um, He loved the book. He read it so long ago that he was like, I actually want to like read it. So we just had this activity that once a week for an hour, he would just read me the book. That's great. Excellent. I love Great book, by the way. Excellent. Yeah, I can't wait to watch the movie. <laughs> Great conversation. Oh my yeah. God, you guys are yeah. awesome. Thanks for coming in. Absolutely. Yeah. I Thank really you appreciate for having it. Me. I'm sure Thank we'll you. do it again for sure. I was yeah, going to say, will. I can keep going. When you said the last <laughs> question, I was like, man. 
<laughs> <laughs> no, we could probably go all day with you. I'm sure, especially talks like this, we share a lot of that on there. that. And that for me has been uh, when I when we meet people in person. Ironically, even though we're a health and fitness podcast, probably the most feedback that I get is when I discuss our relationship, my relationship mm-hmm. with Katrina on the show. A lot of people really appreciate that information, and uh, I think you guys have an incredible dynamic, the two of you. And I also think that when you are it building something that you're building, it's, I know the amount of uh, dedication mm-hmm. and sacrifice uh, emotionally, physically, everything that it takes to do that. And I don't know, there's very few people I feel like that can navigate through that and have a very successful relationship. So I think that's one of the things that I, I look at what you guys are doing. I'm, I'm most impressed with that. Sure. The business, all the things are very, very cool, but to have a partner that you actually work together with day, every single day, you got a fucking production studio <laughs> in your house. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of challenges that come with that. And and I know that it has to take some habits that you guys yeah. have installed to do that. I know it for myself that we, we've had to learn to do that and uh, had a lot of success with that. So I love those were great, great tips. Man. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you again. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.